You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. This episode is brought to you by Hyperice, the leader in advanced warm-up and recovery technology. They have tons of innovative products, like Venom heated wearables to help soothe sore back muscles, Normatec compression boots to speed up recovery and increase circulation, and Hypervolt massage guns to improve mobility. Loved by athletes like Naomi Osaka and Erling Holland. Try them yourself. Get 10% off your order with the code MOVE at hyperrice.com. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident panelist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore daddy. Well, I did decide to take yesterday off. Do apologize for that. But I feel like we covered Washington pretty much top to bottom. Um, So there wasn't a whole lot being left out that needed to be said. And uh, I just felt like doing it, so I did. I do want to get right into some news, though. Um, the Nothing's really changed in terms of expectations of who's playing and who's not. Dennis Kelly and Josh Myers are out. Kevin King, Darnell Savage, Preston Smith still questionable. The big news, I guess, kind of came by way of the fact that Josh Myers was actually put on IR. So obviously with the new IR rules, I don't know exactly how serious that is. It's a minimum of three weeks, um, but that's not what you like to see. Uh, I mentioned how I wasn't super comforted by the head coach's phrasing of um, don't think it's for the year, which I guess it depends on what you thought when it happened. Um, But to me, all I heard was uh, probably not, but it might be the full year. But uh, guard Ben Braden has been activated um, for game day. I don't exactly know what role he'll play, if any, other than being a backup. But um, again, just shuffling around that... um, that offensive line just to make it work. As for Washington, however, um, offensive lineman Sam Cosme, who I think has been out for two weeks, is officially out with his ankle injury. Curtis Samuel, wide receiver, is out with his groin injury. Brandon Scherf, uh, who I believe was out all last week, is going to be out again with his knee injury. Cam Sims, the other wide receiver, is out with his hamstring injury. In addition to that, Antonio Gibson is questionable, as is William Jackson at corner, and Shaka Tony as a uh, at the defensive end position. One thing I didn't think to do for some reason until right now was to solicit uh, patrons about how they're feeling about the game, but I just threw it up there right now. So in the second half, hopefully we'll have some responses. On that note, I do want to say thank you very much to Kylie Butner jumping in on Patreon, signed up for the full year. I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. If you want to jump in, get involved with the other patrons, questions, polls, etc., etc., and get signed up for as little as a dollar per month. Anyways, it's been kind of up and down for a while now, but as it sits right now after the injuries and whatnot, the Green Bay Packers are now eight-point favorites. As you know, this is the biggest since the Detroit game when we were 11.5-point favorites, but even against Chicago, we were only six-point favorites. Um, As I've mentioned in the past, Matt LaFleur has never lost a game when we've been uh, this big of favorites. I don't remember exactly what the number was. It's like seven points or something, but um, he is officially undefeated. The last time we did lose with this big of a spread... Um, it was the December 2nd game, 2018, 13.5 point favorites against the Arizona Cardinals. We ended up losing by three. I, I don't know. Let me see when that game was, what week that was. So we were, I think at the conclusion of the game, I don't remember exactly how this works, but four, seven and one. So again, I don't know how in the world, I know that was a bad one because I know Arizona was terrible, but as bad as the Packers had been, up to that point, how in the world do you give us that big of a, of a of an advantage? We won four games up to that point and tied the Vikings once. But anyways, uh, that was the last time we were a massive advantage. And I don't even think anybody was super surprised. I do remember Arizona was super, super duper garbage. Um, and that was, I think that was the game where I said I wouldn't be surprised if he was fired after that one. Was he? I don't, I don't know. It doesn't matter. We don't need to rehash that. But uh, surprisingly enough, this is only the, what, seventh time that we've had this big of an advantage, according to Vegas, since Matt LaFleur has taken over. Um, The other times, get organized here, just want to go by date, Uh, one of them was actually against Washington, we won by five. We're 13-point favorites and won by five. 
We had uh, in 2019 against Detroit, we were 13 and a half point favorites. We won by three. Not saying we blow them out every time. Let's just keep that in mind. Um, 13 and a half point favorites against Jacksonville, November 15th, we won by four. Eight point favorites against Philadelphia in 2020, we won 30 to 16. Um, nine and a half point favorites December 13th against Detroit, we won 31 24. Eight point favorites against Carolina in December of 2020, we won by eight. There you go. And then uh, the Detroit game where we won by, you know, 35 to 17. So again, it, it's all I said was undefeated. In fact, they've only actually covered the spread twice. So if you're looking for, you know, the actual spread and should you, no, you should probably go under. One push, one, two, three, four times not covered, and twice they covered. But they won, and that's really all I care about. By the way, as far as the over-under, if you're curious in these games, it's almost always under, with the the one exception being this past Detroit game, um, thanks to the Packers putting up 35. But, it, I mean, just if you just listen to those scores, they're all pretty low, 24-16, 20-15, 23-20. So... If it holds true, the Packers win, but not necessarily in a barn burner, although the most recent time, we beat them pretty handily. Other games of interest, by the way, Chiefs-Titans I find interesting just because I still feel like these two teams are potentially dangerous teams. Not only that, we play the Chiefs. So if Tennessee beats Kansas City, they're in a real bad spot. Because at that point, assuming they're going to beat the Giants, and I'm assuming they will, they'd be 4-4 four and four going up against us as against the Green Bay Packers, which is crazy to think about. Also, they have not won two games in a row this entire season. They won last week, and it's their second game on the road. So again, that, that that's one I think to keep an eye on, mostly because we got to play them in just a handful of weeks here. Lions-Rams isn't all that important. Uh, you could find reasons to care, like wanting to watch the Lions lose or maybe even hoping for a fluke win so that the Rams fall one, but minus 16 is <laughs> is where that one stands. So best of luck. If you want to bet the under, fine, but uh, it wouldn't count on the Lions winning that game. Bears-Tampa Bay is just going to be an awesome game to watch. The only thing that would make it not good is if uh, Justin Fields looked like Pat Mahomes, but then they still lost. would be like, oh, that kind of stinks. I mean, good that they lose, I guess, but... Um, I wouldn't mind some kind of a fluke victory over Tampa Bay. It would make me a little bit happy. But pick one or the other. You know, if, if you're going to look good, win. Otherwise, just look like trash and get embarrassed, and that's fine too. Texans, Cardinals, I mean, we play Arizona, Not I wouldn't even say next week, in, in a handful of days here. Now, although I have no expectation of the Texans even putting up a little bit of a fight against Arizona, it's still worth watching. There's a big difference in terms of my level of confidence against Arizona if it's a 23-20 victory as opposed to a 43-0 victory. Just some level of, well, maybe they're human would be nice. Also, not saying I'm rooting for it, but injuries are significant because the ability to turn around and recover is very low in this short span of time. 49ers, Colts doesn't super matter. Saints, Seahawks does for a couple different reasons. The New Orleans Saints are 3-2, and two, and I'm still not entirely sure if they're a good team or a bad team. I mean, aside from blowing us out, they got embarrassed by Carolina. Uh, they did beat New England, but I don't know what New England is. They somehow lost to the Giants and then beat Washington, which isn't really an accomplishment. So I don't know what they are. And then Seattle is uh, quite bad this year so far at 2-4, and four, and we play them in a handful of weeks. And so seeing what the Russell-less Seahawks look like, I'm assuming we're playing without Russell, but I guess I don't know. It's worth watching. Anyways, let's let's get into this a little bit because, um, again, I just want to rehash kind of what I've talked about. And I went on two different Washington football team um, podcasts, or one was a podcast, one was a YouTube channel. And in in both cases, it was very clear that they recognize, unlike some fan bases, they recognize they don't have a very good team. Some some different teams, it's, it's not quite that way. Even with the Bears, as bad as they've been for as long as they've been, there's still an element of pride take pride in their defense and some other pieces here and there. Um, When I talked to the Saints guy, there was lots of pride all over the place, and they ended up obviously winning. But uh, in in the case of Washington, there was none. They just basically said that things are horrible, and a big part of the focus has been on the off-field things, which is not insignificant in, in terms of how that affects the play on the field as well. Mentioned that when I talked about the Bears Raiders game and how I thought that was kind of a fluke, because the Raiders were heavily impacted by the things that are going on off the field that hit them the morning before the game. And so I want to illuminate 
some of those things. One of the things that I used to use a lot that I haven't in a while, PFF has, and it's just little matchup charts. Basically what it looks at is the quality of your player against the quality of the player you're probably going to be going up against, and how big of an advantage or disadvantage that is. The second highest wide receiver advantage goes to Devontae Adams of the Green Bay Packers. Now, again, obviously that has something to do with his level of talent, but it also speaks to how bad Washington is. In other words, the gap between how good your player is and how bad their defense is, the bigger that gap, the bigger the advantage. Now, number one is Cooper Cup against Detroit and all their defenders, but still, Devontae Adams, number two. But that's not all. We know Devontae is a top-end player. What about at tight end? Because they have a tight end matchup chart as well. Robert Tunyon, who hasn't really done very much and has a 48.4 offensive grade via PFF, which is what we're using, has the ninth highest tight end advantage of anybody in the NFL, 14% advantage over what they project to be Mr. Jamin Davis. So I, I guess I just want to reiterate how big of an advantage we have in this game as compared to some other teams. I mean, outside of the Lions, we've just never really seen this. Even with the Saints, and I had talked about the Saints and how they had really bad interior defensive lines, we should be able to run the ball, and obviously that didn't happen. And the Saints' corners were not as good as they had used to be, but they still had some guys that at one point or another were premier guys. And they still had a really, really good linebacker that we all knew about. Washington has a defensive line, and their defensive line is actually somewhat similar to the Packers in that they do generate pressures. They very rarely convert those pressures into sacks. And when I had talked to, um, I was doing my interview yesterday, one of the things that came up is how terrible the defensive coordinator is doing, how terrible of a job he's doing at, at calling things specifically, and Packer fans I, I had mentioned would know this very well, you'll get like a third and four situation with the corners eight yards off. But the, the point is, whether it's bad play calling or just terrible corner play, there's generally always somebody open. And that's going to be a hindrance for this group to be able to generate pressure, especially against an offensive line that, as banged up as it is, has done a decent enough job of keeping Rodgers clean at least long enough. And again, what, what do the, the, does Washington have to slow this down? PFF has them rated as the second worst coverage unit in all of football with a 36 overall grade. Detroit is the only team that's worse. Just went back and listened to it. I can definitely hear the dog barking, so apologize for that, but it is what it is. But really, I mean, the, the defensive line is being put in an impossible task. Get to the quarterback while one of the worst groups of linebackers and cornerbacks and safeties tries to cover before one of these guys gets open. Oh, and by the way, you have the number one wide receiver in all of football, Devontae Adams, as well as the number 13 wide receiver in Randall Cobb, mostly because of his one good game, but I'm going to call it that anyways. And you got two guys who are just dying for that one big breakout game in Alan Lazard and Robert Tunyon. And I haven't even talked about the running backs, who also are very involved in the passing game. If you look at linebackers, and there's only about, I, I, I put an arbitrary number of 350 snaps. There's only 17 linebackers that have done that. What I'm looking for is the guys that rarely come off the field. Because the Packers and Washington both have that guy. For the Packers, it's Devondre Campbell, right? And there's a bunch of other linebackers that'll come in and out here and there, whatever. Same with Washington. They got Cole Holcomb, and then there's guys that kind of get filtered in here and there. Cole Holcomb is the third worst coverage linebacker of this group. C.J. Mosley and Alex Anzalone are the only guys that have worse coverage grades, and it's not by much. Cole Holcomb, 41 overall grade. C.J. Mosley, 40.5. Anzalone, 40.1. They're basically all three tied. This is the guy that has to guard the, the middle of the field that we're trying to throw at with guys like Tunyon, et cetera, et cetera. And again, you, you, can, you can play with this all you want and be like, yeah, well, they'll have other linebackers or they'll have safety help. Are, are you telling me they're going to double team Tunyon? As slowly as he's played, I, I would be stunned if there's more than one person on Tunyon. And that's assuming they're not just sitting in zone, in which case Tunyon's job is to just find the open zone, open hole in the zone, and catch the football. And I do understand the concern. And I even brought that up yesterday with, I, I, I don't really understand with the defensive line that you have, how it is that you rank so poorly. By the way, their rank on defense is dead last. According to, you know, if you just look at yards and points, just straight up statistics, this is the worst defense in all of football. 
Now, it's not going to be that way via PFF. In fact, Washington is tied for 18th on defense, which is far from that. But what PFF does is looks at the quality of the overall roster. But again, we understand that they have talent. They have the third best defensive tackle in all of football, according to them. What I'm talking about, though, isn't that they have good players in certain areas. It's the production. Because at the end of the day, as much as stats can be stupid and misleading and all these different kinds of things, at the end of the day, the numbers are all that matters. You want to get down into the nitty gritty and say, well, what's causing, what is, you know, what, what's the nuance? What's a, that's important, but it's the ultimate overall output that matters. You can have number ones at every single position. If you're 32nd on defense, well, I mean, just think of it from that perspective. What would you choose? Number ones or twos and threes at every single position, but somehow dead last on defense? In other words, there's some kind of way in which they're performing really, really well, grading out really, really well. Everybody is. I mean, this is an impossibility, but bear with me. But the production is dead last, or kind of like the Packers, where the production is actually that of a top 10 defense, despite the fact that there's kind of a lot of guys without good grades, and not very many with very high-end elite grades. I don't think we have a number. Well, we do. We have Devondre Campbell. I I, I would venture to guess, and I'll, I don't have to guess, so I'll just look at it. And it would have been wrong. I was, I was going to say I would venture to guess they have more high-end players than we do, that being 70 and above. They have three. We actually have four. Now, they do have one that's pretty close. Um, Deron Payne is, a, well, he's a 63. I guess if we're going to call that close, then we got a couple of those guys too. Amos is a 68. But I mean, it, it's, it's, it doesn't look like the Packers have a, let's just say, top half production defense. And Washington is dead last based on this. We have... Um, Preston with a 72 overall grade, Kenny with a 79, Gary with an 80.4, and Campbell with an 84.7. That's it. Otherwise, it's, uh, you know, we got Amos at 68, you got Barnes and Savage in the 50s, you got Stokes in the 50s, and you got Yadam over there at 35, who hopefully is not going to be playing, and you got Kiki and Lowry in the 50s, both at 58. But again, it's the output that matters, and and, and I think it was, it was illuminating when I did that podcast because it just it really started to click because it reminded me of the Packers with um, Patton, where you go over to PFF and guys are grading out real well. You know, Jair's on the team. Preston's somewhere in the 70s. Or, well, yeah, Preston's in the 70s. Kenny's in the 70s. Rashawn's in the 70s. Zadarius is probably like an 88. And Amos and Savage are both in the 70s, possibly one of them in the 80s, right? I mean, just from, from, from end to end, it's just a quality unit. But the production wasn't there. And, and the way he described the team felt so familiar to me where it's like I, he just, with exasperation, described things that made no sense. Again, the, the guys with uh, playing so far off, or he described to me in one instance, I forget the exact situation, but essentially a guy ran a go route in a very go routey kind of a, a situation. And the corner essentially shifted his body toward him and after he ran past him, suddenly realized, oh, I better start running, and was several strides behind him, obviously. And I believe he caught that for either a touchdown or a massive gain, and the safety came and cleaned it up. I don't know the particulars of it. But just inexplicable things like that that make you go, what, what is happening? This is the most embarrassing thing in the world. In other words, they're, they're exact opposites. What the Packers have, despite talent, is cohesion. It shouldn't work, but somehow it just is. The plan is coming together, and people are doing just enough to make it work. Washington has talent, but they don't have a way of putting it together. Again, it reminds me very much of what we had with Mike Pettin. We have the talent. It's just, it never really, you know, it's round peg, square hole. And, and I mean that from the sense of the defensive line working with the defensive line, working with the edge rushers, working with the linebackers. Nothing worked in sync, in tandem, nothing. Nothing made any sense. He described to me also, I mean, it sounds like the worst of both because it was very Mike Petney. And then he also described to me something that reminded me very much of the Dom Capers days. And that was third and longs are a nightmare for Washington because whether it's rushing three or whatever the case may be, they're always going to give up third and longs. He said it could be third and 20. doesn't matter. You guys will convert it. And I said, believe me, I know what that's like also. We actually started the season that way under Joe Barry. And it was terrifying because I'm like, oh, here we go with the Dom Capers defense all over again. It's bend, don't break, and uh, don't give up anything unless it's third and long. Then give up uh, about what you need. You know, third and 18, give them like 21. But that's the state of Washington. Is there talent there? Yeah, there's talent there. But they don't know what they're doing. They're lost. They're confused. There's no cohesion. And it's ugly. And the offense isn't much better. Now, the offensive line is 
I mean, it's it's pretty premier. I mean, from from end to end, the lowest grade they have on this offensive line is a 70.6. Even with the two subs coming in, those are actually two of the highest grades of anybody. Lucas and Schweitzer, who actually were starters last year, so it's not like they're just some bums off the street. Um, 79 and an 81.8. They've given up some of the fewest pressures, the fewest sacks, the fewest anything. They don't give up anything by way of, of pressure. And I talked about that when I was on the show yesterday and said it surprised me because you've got such a good offensive line, you would think your quarterback has a ton of time to throw and there should be some holes to run through. And he kind of just shrugged and was like, yeah, well, you'd think. (laughs) Again, we've got the talent. It's just, it's not being put together. And and Heineke is just, he kind of likened it to Brett Favre, but but a really bad version of Brett Favre. He said he, he said he, he grew up loving Brett Favre, was a Packer fan, wanted to be a gunslinger, but he's Brett Favre without without the rocket arm. And so he wants to sling it down the field, but he doesn't have the arm to do it. And he's also more late-stage Brett Favre, where there's way too many many interceptions. And I went over his stats. His official stats are nine touchdowns, six interceptions. But he said in one game, there were three dropped interceptions that Heineke could have given up. He said he easily could be nine touchdowns and 12 interceptions at this point in the season if it wasn't for all the, uh, the missed interceptions which isn't too far off because according to uh, PFF, he's had 10 turnover-worthy plays, meaning there were 10 instances in which somebody coulda, woulda, shoulda got an interception. And that's not all interceptions. There were zero turnover-worthy plays against the Giants, and the Giants had a pick. So his observation is even more correct because some of these picks are tips or whatever the case may be where you end up getting a pick. That isn't necessarily the quarterback just throwing a terrible ball at the defender. So take 10 times plus all the fluky ones. Yeah, you're probably sitting at about 12. He went on to say he doesn't know how to read a defense. It's funny because today is sort of trash the opponent day, and all I'm doing is referencing the interview I was on yesterday when that guy trashed his own opponents. <laughs> By the way, I should probably give a shout out. It's the Tim's Sports Talk. Uh, it's a YouTube channel. It's T I M S, not Tim Sports Talk. But uh, good dude, go check him out for sure. But again, really, it's it's they've got Terry McLaurin. Terry McLaurin's a good wide receiver, but they don't have anything else. Adam Humphreys, 104th out of 110 wide receivers. This is like the next highest guy on the list in terms of routes run, targets, all that kind of stuff. This is their number two. This is their go-to guy, Adam Humphreys, one of the worst wide receivers in football right now. Diami Brown, who I think is questionable for this game, is slightly worse, 106th out of 110. So these are two of the worst wide receivers right now in all of football. By the way, Heineke, 30th out of 33, I had mentioned. McKissick, their running back, is 40th out of 59. Gibson, the other running back, is 51st out of 59, even slightly worse. So, I mean, the point is, what are you supposed to do? What do you What do you do? Assuming this is a slightly competent defense, despite the, the talent, whether they have talent or not, they, they know how to, you know, run a scheme. You got a quarterback that doesn't know how to read defenses. This is direct quote from Tim's sports show. He doesn't know how to read a defense. He doesn't have a cannon for an arm. Throws way too risky of throws. He's got some time in the pocket because he's got a pretty good group up in front of him. But the run game is lacking. And outside of Terry McLaurin, there really aren't a lot of options to go to. Seals Jones, the tight end, 66 overall grade. Still 23rd out of 68, so he's not abysmal, but he's barely average. What do you do? I mean, what what is your game plan here? We're going to run the... uh, Well, no, I don't know about that. They got Smith and Gary and Clark and Campbell. That's kind of where the strength of their team is. Well, we could throw it, but then you got to rely on Heineke, you got to rely on Diami Brown, you got to rely on Ricky Seals Jones, you got to rely on these guys making plays. Because, you know, if you're Aaron Rodgers and Devontae Adams, you can probably force feed all day long, get away with it, and still walk away with a win. I don't know if Heineke and McLaurin is exactly that level of, of competent quarterback wide receiver duo. And likewise, the other way, what do you do? Other than just unleash the hounds and hope for the best, I don't know what you do. And by the way, if they just pin their ears back and, and go attack Aaron Rodgers, that's not going to work very well. They have too many things at their disposal. They're going to throw wide receiver screens, running back screens, tight end screens. They're going to get motion going. They're, they're, they're going to hit the, the jet sweeps. They're, they're going to get you guys running laterally all day long. And if you over-pursue, you're going to be way out of position. And then you got Cole Holcomb and Jamin Davis and uh, all these other guys trying to come up and make plays, and they're not good at football. There was some optimism by... Uh, by Mr. Timms about Landon Collins, the safety, possibly coming in and playing a little bit of linebacker. Uh, He has a strong safety, kind of getting him up close to the line of scrimmage, seeing what he can do in that capacity. Unfortunately, he's one of the lowest graded guys on that team so far. Now, 
It's largely because of his coverage ability, which is a 38.3 overall grade. He's given up 18 receptions for 283 yards, one including a 72-yard reception. He's given up three touchdowns and doesn't have a single pick or pass breakup, 143.6 passer rating when targeted. But the excitement is, let's just give up the entire facade of him being able to cover, call him a linebacker, and have him work downhill, because he's got a 74 run defense grade. Tackling isn't super great, but it's fine, I guess. Yes, there's any given Sunday. Yes, anything can happen. Yes, there's concerns about a trap game, especially with a short game week coming up and Arizona being the opponent on Thursday to overlook Washington. But assuming the Packers don't just lay down, assuming the Packers put together a similar quality of game that they have the last five weeks, what do you do if you're Washington? What's the game plan? I have no idea what you do other than hope and pray for a Packers collapse, which is possible. What do you do? I have no idea. We're going to take a break. We're going to see what the folks on Patreon have been coming up with. Uh, Hopefully they got a decent amount for us. Again, if you want to support the podcast, patreon.com forward slash pack underscore daddy, or just tell your friends, tell your neighbors, tell your uh, spouse and your kids and everybody else to go get a phone, get a job, get a phone, download the app, any app that has podcasts and uh, subscribe to the pack on a podcast. If you do automatic download, that'd be great. It'll just download it and you don't even have to listen. I still get credit for it. That'd be great. Thank you so much for that. I think that's how that works. I don't really know. Anyways, we'll take a break, and we'll be right back. Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have, because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots, where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple. Just whip out your phone, do a little beep boop bop boop, that's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place, and you can get the app and try it out for yourself. So go ahead and test drive U.S. Cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days. That's U.S. Cellular, built for us. Terms apply. Awards based on open signal, independent data. So go to uscellular.com for all the details. I want to tell you guys real quick about our new sponsor, Factor. Factor makes delicious, ready-to-eat meals, and they get sent right to your door. They have 35 different options every single week that you can choose from, including keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and more. And there's even more to enjoy with over 55 nutrition-packed add-ons that help make your weekly meal planning even more delicious. There's no prep work. There's no messing up six different bowls, mixing stuff. Factor meals are 100% ready to heat and eat. No prep, no cook, no cleanup. Factor is also very flexible with your schedule. You can get as much or as little as you need by choosing between 6 to 18 meals per week. You can also pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. Factor is less expensive than takeout, and every meal is dietitian approved. So head to factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 and use code packdaddy50 to get 50% off. That's code packdaddy50 at factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 to get 50% off. This episode is brought to you by Pepsi Wild Cherry. Pepsi Wild Cherry is bursting with delicious cherry flavor and a sweet, crisp taste that gives you more to go wild for. Getting wild may look different these days, but whether it's opting for a solo Friday binge watch or a big night out, everyone can indulge in their wild side with Pepsi Wild Cherry, also available in Zero Sugar. So grab a Pepsi Wild Cherry and get wild. All right, so I posted two different things on Patreon. How you feeling about the game and give me some game predictions. So we're going to start with how you feeling. We'll get to the predictions. I'll give my prediction and then we'll call it a day. First of all, from David, he says, confident Packers are the better team. Just keep AR clean. That's a perfect start to this little segment because that's exactly how I ended the last one. Packers are the better team. That's it. There's nothing else to say about that. Just go be you and you win. That's it. Go be you, get the W. And that's not just the... the players. It's the coaches. It's everybody. You got to, you know, there's no overlooking this. There's no sneaking a peek at the Cardinals. You got to put together a good enough game plan like you've done the last five weeks. Make sure you're fully prepared, all that stuff. You got to win. 
Chris says, I got to tell you, I'm nervous. I'm afraid they don't show up looking ahead to the coming Thursday. This is the definition of a trap game. Come on, boys, let's do this. It really is. I mean, you can say trap game about just about anything. You know, if it's if it's a good team going up against a subpar opponent, you can call it a trap game. But you look at the fact that what Washington does well is the trenches, which is scary because that's what makes it hard on the Packers usually is when a team is really good in the trenches. And then, like you said, a short week and a really high quality, possibly the best team in football coming up um, just a handful of days after. I mean, it, it, it really is the full definition, probably the purest definition, you know. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, they, they, they know this. And uh, it's up to Matt LaFleur to make sure that their, their minds are in the right place and recognizing that this will be a loss prior to Arizona if you guys don't prepare properly and not focus on Arizona. Goose says, pretty good, honestly. This, by all means, should be a blowout. But even if it isn't, I don't care as long as we get the win and come out healthy. That's another underrated thing to talk about. I kind of talked about it briefly, that it's really hard to come back from injury. Um, This is not a game that you want to see injuries, because even minor tweaks and things like that, you might be out. I mean, we don't usually even get updates until Wednesday. And by then, it's like, well, we got, you'll have a handful of guys that didn't practice, but they'll be fine. On a Thursday game, the the you know if we look at the uh, the injury report, we got two guys out this week. We had Dennis Kelly, Josh Myers, Darnell Savage, and Preston Smith. I don't know if Savage and Smith and and you know King are going to play, but there's a good chance that if this was a Thursday game, we would have no Preston, we would have no Darnell, and I don't even know if King would play. I mean, he's still questionable, having had three days. There's a good chance that he wouldn't have played if our game was on Thursday. So it's important. But but again, that's another thing where it's like you don't want guys to take your foot off the gas. I mean, always avoid injury anyways. Don't be reckless trying to tackle with the you know top of your head or side of your head or any part of your head. But yeah, whatever can be done, let's do that. Mike says this win is very important with the next few games being just brutal. You know, the only thing, the other thing that sticks out in my mind that makes me nervous is just having been in this exact same situation previously. I don't know if it was 2019 or 18 or what year it was, but it was a very similar situation. We had Washington. I got to find it because I've referenced it like nine times and I don't know what I'm talking about here. So I believe it was the 2018 season, which to be fair, it makes me slightly less, less nervous knowing it was that garbage of a season in 2018. But And I don't remember who was a good team or, or, or expected to be a good or bad team that season, but I remember Washington being a team that you kind of just look past. Um, I don't think Buffalo was very good all the way back then. They ended up being 6-10. and 10. Um, who else would, and I know San Francisco was there. They ended up four and 12, but again, I don't know what the perception was, but all I know is I knew that there were going to be tougher games ahead. And maybe it was just a general thought of, you know, you might lose five games this season. If you lose these kinds of games, those are when you look at all these, let's say five, six tough opponent, like a real tough opponent. If you're just trying to win three of those six, if you lose to Washington in a way, you kind of got to find a way to win four of six. You can't be giving up games like this. And we played Washington. It was in Washington, but we got annihilated 31-17. And it just felt bad. But I guess it was, it, I'm actually glad I went back and looked at it because um, acknowledging that that was just, it wasn't necessarily that that was just a classic trap game in which the Packers are real good and uh, went into Washington and lost to a team they shouldn't have lost to. Washington ended with a better record than we did. We only won six games that year. We've already won five this year. We beat Buffalo, lost to Detroit by eight points two weeks later, beat San Francisco, came out of our bye, lost by two points to the Rams, got annihilated by the Patriots, uh, destroyed Miami, got uh, beat by Seattle, beat by Minnesota, beat by Arizona, beat the Falcons, lost to the Bears, which is always horrible, beat the Jets, and got absolutely embarrassed 31 nothing to Detroit, which was one of the sickest feelings I've had in a while. But yeah, I mean, that that's just... Uh, that's what my mind goes to is that week. And for whatever reason, I mean, I did have the podcast at that point, so I must have been talking about it. So there's some part of that buried in my brain. But again, if, if you just think about w- what is a trap game, it's when the Packers who are favorites lose to the lesser team because of this, that, or the other reason. Now, we can talk all we want about Matt LaFleur not getting his guys ready or whatever the case may be, but I just showed you at the beginning of this podcast, the Packers don't lose when they're big favorites. It ha- They haven't had a trap game type of moment. And you can say, well, I remember this game or that. That's fine, but we weren't as big of favorites as you remember. That doesn't mean it's impossible. I fully understand, well, you know, past success, blah, 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 is no indication of whatever. It is some indication. 
Fact of the matter is the Packers have played 30 games since Matt LaFleur has been the head coach, five of which they've lost when they were um, the favorites. Only five times in 30 when they were the favorites. And the biggest, um, the biggest loss we had was November of 2020 when we lost to Minnesota. We were five and a half point favorites. And I suppose you could make an argument that it was a bit of a trap game with San Francisco coming up. Uh, they got to travel. It was at San Francisco, so they got to fly back out. Maybe they were nervous about it, and that hindered their ability against the Minnesota Vikings with their five and a half point favorites over. But again, it very rarely happens. Actually, that was a Thursday game too. Oh, shoot. Now I'm getting nervous. <laughs> they had to travel to San Francisco on a Thursday, and that Sunday prior to, which was a noon game, they were five and a half point favorites against Minnesota, and they lost by six points, 28-22. Oh, and it just keeps getting worse. Vikings were 1-5 in five up to that point. I was going to show how they were a better team up to that point, but they just weren't. Well, it is what it is. Even despite their record, again, it was only 5.5 points. The Vikings, I do think, were a better team than this Washington team we're going up against. Anyways, getting away from the uh, comments here. Mark says, excited to see how we will do. Excited for the next man up. Interested to see the offensive line. That's a good attitude, Mark. I'm nervous about next man up. He's excited about next man up. George says, cautious. Obviously a trap game. We need uh, need and should win this. Just hope to come away with no major injuries. Covered it, but yeah, that's pretty much top to bottom. Just find a way to win. Doesn't have to be pretty, and please stay healthy. Uh, Philippe or Felipe, I don't know. Also trap game, big matchup against NFC contender on a short week with Arizona. Adams and Jones must feast. Stokes have another great duel with McLaurin. Interesting confrontations in the trenches. Packers should and must come out on top. That whole need and should thing is really coming through in these comments. But yeah, I do think that's an underrated um, thing that needs to, I shouldn't say need, it doesn't need to happen, but it's really going to help our chances. I think if we can run the ball well, we'll be okay. If we can't, we can still win, but it's just never good when you become one-dimensional especially when then they start releasing the hounds, Aaron Rodgers stuck in a collapsing pocket. It just kind of devolves. Establish the run early and don't give up on it. Jason says, I feel there will be great intensity from our guys at Lambeau being in front of the home crowd again after a big Bears win and the whole I own you thing. That's a good point. It is at home. They got the, the jerseys. I wonder if that's part of the reason. Seems like they're really building up quite a bit here. Try to gin up as much excitement as possible. Make sure we get a ton of uh, people there. Probably in our favor um, that it's against Washington at home. It's going to be very unlikely there's going to be a lot of Washington fans there. So there's a lot of opportunity for Packer fans to be there, to be loud. So hopefully it's a super, you know, hyped environment. He goes on to say, just feeling a real, a real positive vibe coming from the guys and think uh, this is where we get to see the offense click a little better and get more rhythm. Devontae is due another massive turnout, and I suspect we allow the tight ends a little more freedom this game knowing it's the front four and front four only to worry about. Exactly. With the tight ends versus linebacker matchups, it should be pretty solid. We'll see what happens with Landon Collins. Again, not that he's good, but you know, as far as linebackers go, maybe he's fine. I don't know. Jason goes on to say, I see a quick pass or two right off the line of scrimmage for him to just head up field with it. Packers by 16. I like it. Finally, just hit refresh to see if there's any new ones. Wayne says, feeling good despite the injuries. Green Bay has enough players to win this one walking away. That is a good point, too. We, we do have a lot of injuries, but um, there's nothing really new in this game that you look at and go, yeah, but with that guy out, we're in trouble, especially considering how dire it's been. Not saying we don't have new injuries because there are, you know, Preston, if he plays, I don't know. But the point is we've learned we can manage with what we've got, and that's a pretty good feeling. Moving over finally to the game predictions. Goose says, if all goes well, 31-20 Packers. That was, I think on my uh, thing yesterday, I said, what did I say, 30 to 20? I think he said like 31-20, I said 30 to, or no, 24. I said 30-24. Uh, anyways, whatever. It <laughs> wasn't that close, I guess. But it's a, it's a, it's it's in that range. Low 20s compared to low 30s. Uh, we got it again with uh, Matt says, Packers win 34-20. Tunyon with a touchdown. Gary has two sacks. I dig that. Eric says 28-17 Packers. They'll start slow with no intensity. Get it going in the second quarter. That's uh, it's the safest money you'll ever put down. Jim says, I think it'll be closer than it should be, and the Washington football team defense begins to show up 21-17. Again, I'd be fine with that, and it's not that un uncommon. It is somewhat of a trap game environment. There are going to be some of that. And, and the other thing is it doesn't have to be a full team that just doesn't show up. It could be a couple players, but those players 
who would have ordinarily shown up are playing at half speed because of this, that, or the other. And so you still get sort of that trap game element where it, where you're watching the game and going, why aren't they playing very well? It doesn't have to be the whole team. It could be 20% of the team, but you notice it. George says 31-20 pack. Man, it's everyone's kind of in sync. Mark, real, really feeling good about this one, says 34-9 Packers. Jason says 31-17. Aaron says 42-18. to That would be cool. We haven't had a big 40-burger. We need one of those. Brandon says 24-21 pack, and the fan base will be very angry. <laughs> Wayne says Green Bay 32, the footballs 17. Hit refresh one more time. Oh, we got one. Killian sneaks it in there. I was going to say Wayne closed us out on both of those, but Killian got it in. He says 31-10 to the pack. Wow. Any, any and all would make me happy. And here's the other thing. If Washington comes out and they drive down the field, let, let, let's, let's even back it up further. Let's say the Packers go three and out. Washington gets the ball. They drive down the field, and they get a touchdown. First of all, we've seen that happen in what feels like every single game so far this season. So do not panic. Don't run on Twitter or the Facebook group and start screaming about, I'm not watching this game. This is trash. I hate this team, et cetera, et cetera. I knew this was going to be a trap game. Don't do it. You know why? 31-10 is still a possibility. <laughs> It is. So take it easy. Gonna be fine. My final prediction, I'm gonna I'm gonna go 30-24, keeping it relatively close, but uh, still a comfortable enough win. Although as I'm saying, same thing that happened last time. I had a really good prediction, but then I I said like 25, and I'm like, that's the dumbest number in the world. And I was very close, except I said 25. Now I'm sitting here thinking, how do they get to 24 points? But you know, stuff happens. They've got some some pieces, and our defense might not have a good game. Sticking with that 30 to 24. I'm going to get out of here. You folks have yourselves a fantastic day. Um, After the game, I may go live. No guarantees. We'll see how it goes. You never know. Um, If we do lose the game, that lowers the likelihood that I do it because it's just, it's tough to do. But I would appreciate you keeping an eye out for that. If nothing else, uh, I will talk to you tomorrow on the podcast. Bye-bye.